You are listening to Zoom, the retro comic book show. Here it comes, here it comes, my friend. Welcome to Doom. I'm your host, Timmy Doom. This episode, once again, I'm finally joined again by Derek Crabb from History of Comics on Films website. Hey, what's, what's up, up Tim? How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing fine, man, fine. Yourself, how is your 2012 so far? Uh, yeah, 2012. It's a new year. Uh, you know, just busy working uh, my regular work and uh, also trying to work hard to get out uh you know, new new history of comics on film videos and podcasts and, you know, hopefully find time to, to read comics and stuff like that. But, yeah, I'm always happy to, to shoot the shit about comic books with you. So it's uh, it's a good start to the year because I'm, I'm here on Thum. Great. <laughs> cool. That is the best way for anybody to start <laughs> their year. But, oh, yeah, we're going to – it's 2012, but we're going to go back like uh, 20-something years uh, to review – to continue our review of Damage Control, we did Volume One. I don't know when it was. It was last year sometime. Yeah, yeah. It was a while ago. That was too. I know I didn't intend for it to be that far of a gap, but we're going to do Volume Two. Go through the four issues of it. it uh, Damage Control for y'all, y'all who know, don't know is a late '80s comic series. It was started in like '89. There was like there was three mini series in the eighties, early nineties, and then he had a one recently a few years ago. Who's he? Dwayne McDuffie. He's the creator of Damage Control. And uh yeah, let's get into Oh, Damage Control is a company, a a corporation, a construction company that uh fixes all the damage caused by superhero and supervillain battles, mostly in New York City. So uh and, that's and, it, I guess. And here they come now. Yeah, yes, that's <laughs> that is them. Hey, hey. <laughs> but uh, I was gonna shout out their name, but I forgot. Hey, Gene. <laughs> Actually, I forgot to get out all the names. Oh, I didn't write because I I remember the stories, but I don't remember all the names. But I I'll look it up on Wikipedia here. Okay, so we'll start with uh, issue one of volume two. That what was that one? That was okay. That was all right. That was the one with Captain America on the cover. And the storyline is basically uh, damage control. Uh, it was a mix-up, and damage control goes to the vault to fix some problems. But actually, the, <laughs> the problem is that the vault, which is a high-security uh, prison for supervillains, has been a uh, the, the prisoners have escaped. Basically, there's been a breakout, and. Uh, that, that's a common theme that's been revisited in Avengers a few times throughout the years. Yeah, it was actually, I, you know, what was funny, what I was thinking about was I, I remember a lot, I, not a lot, but I remember criticism over the Earth's uh, Mightiest Heroes cartoons, you know, like they kind of, I guess the for that is, you know, well, at least in the break beginning out. is yeah. that, you know, they break out and everything, you know, and so I was thinking there, because cause I was like, you know, a lot of people were like, what is this Pokemon? Like, you got to catch them all. <laughs> like, you know, people were like complaining about it, at least, you know, on some of the boards I went to. And, and while I was reading that, I just felt vindicated. I'm like, look, look, uh, Avengers Spotlight 26, like 200 <laughs> guys broke out. It's the same shit. Like, I, I was like, I got to I was like, I got to file that away for when whenever I make a video on that cartoon, because I can be like in Avengers Spotlight 26, <laughs> like two, 200 assholes broke out of the vault. You know, or whatever. And then so, again so. in uh, the uh, the mid two thousands with the beginning, the opening of um what was the new Avengers. That was the first storyline. Was a oh yeah, yeah. I don't yeah, know if it yeah, was the vault, but it was a breakout of super. Yeah, it was one of yeah. I think a bunch of those guys. I don't know if that was the. I don't know if that was the vault, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm still looking up on Wikipedia just so I can get the names. But okay, let's go through the storyline here. Uh. So basically, uh, oh, it opens with a. Uh, they're using. There's a bridge that got damaged in a battle. And yeah, yeah. Thor's holding up the the George Washington Bridge. That's a pretty. That's a pretty cool like two page spread there. You know, like uh, I mean, I like. Um, 
I like the pencils in this. Like it's it's Ernie Colon, so like that's a good. I don't know. I, I love all the sort of establishing stuff, and I, I really like all the the you know like to me like I know some people are concerned about like the science of things and and how you know stuff works correctly or whatever. Mm -hmm. But to me, I just I love stuff where it's like you know supreme punching energy, you know, and he's like, "What? You can't punch me?" And he's like, "Yes, I can, because I'm supreme." You know, like I just like that stuff where they're like, "What Thor's doing is physically impossible." I'm like, "I don't care, because I'm Thor." <laughs> you know, like I'm like I'm too cool for physics. So yeah, I like that kind of stuff. Yeah, I like how they they put that out and and, and yeah, how they. We address that is the uh, what's his name Gene, who is their technical guy, you know, the super genius tech who builds all the gadgets for d damage control. He says, according to my calculations, what Dora is doing is not possible. <laughs> and uh, John tells him, don't tell him that. <laughs> so and I like that. It's kind of it's it's comic books. Don't question it. Kind of. Yeah, thing. yeah. Okay. And then you know, I, I I won't try to get into all the details, but I think it's just funny that this black guy, little chubby black guy, who worked for the tr World Trade Center in uh, the last series. The, the World Trade Center got damaged, and he got blamed for it, even though that couldn't be his fault because <laughs> of a super battle happened there. But he got fired because of it, and now his job is in danger again because he works for the city dealing with the, <laughs> this bridge. I don't know if it's the George Washington Bridge. I think it is. Um, yeah, and it's not his fault that something happened. Super Magneto or somebody destroyed this bridge, and now he's begging... Uh, damage album. so I think that's that's funny and uh, the, the main crux of this one is you know it opens up with, at this the vault and I because I, I don't I didn't read every Marvel comic in the 80s when I was a kid but these guys at the vault I remember my uh, it's called the, the the encyclopedia of the Marvel Universe no what? oh hot move the official guide, I don't know the, the whole term, the, but the official guide to the... Oh, world. the official handbook or whatever? Yes, where that's... Where they had all those, yeah. Yeah, and I remember these these green guys here who work at the vault. I just remember... Oh, yeah, the guardsmen? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. yeah, they were always... It was supposed to be like Stark made that armor for all the, uh, the, the you know, I guess guards or the cops or whatever, all the, the prison guards, pretty much, you know, so that, you know, when they were all a bunch of supervillains, they would have... You know, some kind of defense or whatever it was. But then when he went crazy during the armor wars, it was like he, he snatched all those guys' armor. You know, he, he put negator packs on all their armor, too, with <laughs> along with everybody else, you know. Of course, Tony Stark would have fell safe for that. But I, I just remember the image of these guys in the, in the Marvel handbook and the description of the vote. I remember reading that as a kid. And uh, but I what I would get is the warden. He's cowering in his office while there's all kinds of super villains running about. And he this is before cell phones. And he has on his little fo index phone here. In between the Avengers and the National Guard is damage control. Now he meant to call the Avengers or the National Guard, but he pressed the wrong button and called damage control and do misunderstanding. They think that, he, that there's just some damage that has to be fixed, so they send some guys over there to <laughs> uh, from damage control to deal with the problem, and that's the story. They just send John and a quarter other guys over to damage control to deal and from damage control. So there's no body to stop these guys, but damage control once they get there. Yeah, and then like what? It's like the intern kid Bart goes with them and everything like that. So they're all. They're all stuck in the middle of, uh, like, the Wrecking Crew and stuff. And the Wrecking Crew to here is used as comic relief, like they do, uh, what's his face? So who, uh, who's the one who, who they always do him wrong? The Rhino. They always make him look like shit just to, <laughs> just to, when some new... Seems like, I, I, I was kind of, at first, I was, like, reading it, but, like, I kind of take this, at least, as, like, it's, it's borderline parody, you know, like, in a way. So, like, I don't get... I don't get miffed if the Wrecking Crew looks like goofballs, especially because like Thunderball of all of them, mm -hmm. it's like it's like it seems like like he's kind of the smart one and like is kind of in on their little gag that they're doing and everything when they turn off the lights and then he beats the shit out of all of them with his little you know uh, wrecking ball or whatever. But like I you know to me I was like it, it's not the same thing as like I, I I remember getting all upset when like you know Spider Woman beat the shit out of the Wrecking Crew and Ninjas and all that so I'm like what the like I'm like these guys like fight with Thor man like exactly. you know I, I was like they shouldn't be people's bitches but like in this case I was just kind of like you know this is you know it, it's not so much that they 
looked like shit, it's like they beat themselves. So it's like, well, you know, and, and then they had Thunderball's help. So it's not like, to me, I'm like, I can rationalize that and go, and then also kind of on top of that, I'm like, well, this is kind of parody too. You know, it's like you got, you got uh, Lenny at the beginning offering Thor some Ben Gay. You know, he's like, oh, after you lifted the George Washington Bridge for like 12 hours, like, here's some Ben Gay. <laughs> like, slap that on your Asgardian muscles, you know, and you're just kind of like, well, you know what? Like, you, you kind of know up front that it's not going to be like super, you know, heavy or serious. Right. You know? right. So. And then Thor, you know, he turns him down, of course, because he's a god. But then he eventually said, you know what? I think I might need some of that Ben Gay and rubs it on his shirt. He's like, me, me thinks I might need. <laughs> <laughs> so that's 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 cute that's funny but uh what was it? oh but the main some of the main points here was uh yeah thunderball once john and the other and a couple other members of damage control got caught up in between this the wrecking crew which seemed to be the only super villains on the scene john's old friend uh thunderball kind of helps him thwart thwart the rest of the wrecking, wrecking crew and two main points in this before we move to the next issue, I mean, there's probably more on this issue we could talk about, but two main points is that Mrs. Hogue puts Robin in control of, um, uh, what's it, the damage control, because she's going to Washington to work with some superhero advocacy group or something. It's like the the Superhuman Activities Committee, because I think, I think, like, during that time, I think, like, if I'm guessing right, it's like, it's like kind of acts of vengeance error stuff. So, yeah. so like I'm sure they they had like some kind of like I, I kind of remember all those committees from like it's a little earlier than acts of vengeance, but there were people like you know Henry Gyrick and and Val Cooper and like a lot of the you know some of them were like the anti mutant people you know per se, and then you know some of them like dealt with like all that John Walker you know Captain America stuff, okay. and then also like. Uh, if you remember, like, Freedom Force and all those guys, it was, like, basically when they made the, you know, they made the Brotherhood, like, government agents and stuff. Like, to me, I think that all probably reflects, you know, stuff like that. But it's, like, now there's finally, like, people, you know, getting on it, like Miss Hogue, that are not, you know, maybe knee-deep in, in uh, you know, corruption or their own yeah. agenda or what have you, you know. Is that... And then... I, I guess maybe another thing to bring up, because it's probably going to come up later, though, is that uh, they kind of uh, reveal, like, that Tony Stark and Wilson Fisk were, like, financing yep. damage control as partners and stuff. So, like, that's kind of, you know, I guess that's kind of, like, at least when, when you see those, I guess if you've been reading comics for a long time, you're like, oh, okay, these guys have big bucks. Like, that kind of, you know, that makes sense, you know, like, you think to yourself, so. Yeah, but it, it kind of, you know, sullies uh, Tony Stark image to the readers because you know bruce wayne would never do that he always finds himself when when he's dealing with oily characters he won't deal with he won't de let wayne industries be in it you know have the hands in corruption but here tony stark is working with kingpin even though he's saying this is the reason why he yeah and that's the other point of this this issue he they call miss hogue in for a uh meeting because the two owners Wilson Fisk and Tony Stark are selling because Tony Stark doesn't want to be affiliated with Wilson Fisk anymore, but he, he was for a while, you know, that's the big, and to me, it sets it up. I mean, everybody says he's not a bad, you know, they were mad because at civil war in 2006, when Tony Stark was a little less than square jawed hero, <laughs> he was, and this, to me, this sets up precedence for that. And it makes sense to me, you know? That, that he deals with Tony's, I mean, Wilson Fisk because, hey, he's a businessman first. So, but it does, it does sully his, and I, I kind of like that it sullies his character because it sets up stuff for a civil war in the future, you know, 20 years in the future, and he is a businessman. You know, businessmen often deal with stuff like that. They got to deal with bad people sometimes. Well, but I think I think that's kind of the, the, the crux of, of Tony Stark. Like, even if you go back to you know, the, the the first, you know, Tales of Suspense stuff, you know, it's kind of like Stanley's like, oh, you know, I wanted to make the business guy, but then, you know, uh, the, you know, somebody basically, I, I remember Stanley kind of said something in an interview where he's like, oh, I wanted to try this with somebody who I thought my readers wouldn't like, 
You know, like mm-hmm. they, they liked the Hulk because he was a rebel. You know, they liked Spider-Man because, you know, he was like them. He was an everyman and stuff. But he's like, oh, I wonder if I could be successful, you know, making it somebody who they don't like. You know, somebody who's from the quote-unquote establishment. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I always find that kind of funny because, like, sometimes it's like, you know, obviously people love Iron Man and Batman. You know, like they, you know, at least these movies and everything, people eat the shit up because, you know, who w- I mean, you know. Who wouldn't want to be, you know, super, super fucking rich and and have all these beautiful women and and have a suit of armor or a bat suit and break somebody's fucking ankles, you know, and, you know, whatever, whatever it is that your kind of, you know, fantasy trip is. It's like, you know, there's plenty of cool things about that, you know, that, you know, so it's like, to me, I'm kind of like, okay, you know, I I just kind of was like, well, look, Tony thinks damage control is doing some good stuff and, uh. You know, and then it, it, the only thing that I thought was weird about it was his reasoning is he, he he's pulling his funding because he doesn't want to be associated with Fisk anymore. Mm-hmm. But then with Fisk is pulling his money, too. So then I kind of went, well, why doesn't he just buy Fisk out then if he doesn't want to? I mean, if Fisk is pulling out because Miss Ho is leaving, I didn't understand why he just didn't say, ah, fuck it, I'm going to buy the whole yeah, but, the whole kid and caboodle or whatever. Because later on, I think some of the development, I think he had a plan. Wilson Fisk all along to do what he does in the later issues that we find out uh, of mm. this of the series. Then uh, uh, and they're bought out by this company called Carlo Carleton Company or Carleton Co. And <laughs> and and Robin, she's the head of Damage Control now, so she tells everybody about this. And at the end, we see the building they're in, the new building. Uh, <laughs> damage control is in and on the top of the building is a giant DC and I'm like okay <laughs> so later on they use that to some effect too they they use that as a joke later on in the um <clears throat> in the comic book and all I'm seeing here I guess they got little bios for each member of the uh of uh yeah yeah kind of like those handbook entries exactly. you're talking about or for the guardsmen but they have it for all the the uh, I guess you'd say supporting cast members or whatever. But I don't get because I'm just now looking at this for the first time. The two they have here is Gene Strausser and Mrs. Hogue. But they say Mrs. Hogue is a 135 pounds, but and Gene is only 175 pounds. I don't know about that. But but <laughs> Mrs. Hogue does not reveal her full oh, that's true. her full stats uh, to anybody on on the handbook. That, that's yeah. That's that's probably what it is. So all right. So the second issue we got. She she still wants to be hired in Hollywood. You know, you gotta lie about your age and your weight. You know, Miss Hogue is looking to work. She's the CEO of a company. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> and as you were mentioning earlier, okay, to number two, uh, Damage Control has got a <laughs> Punisher on the cover shooting up the offices of Damage Control with Robin and John hiding under their desk like any of us would. And uh, and she makes a little joke. He's one of your accounts, isn't he? And it's cruel and unusual Punisher. I think, okay, that's a cute little pun. But as you were mentioning earlier about Acts of Vengeance, yes, this is around the time of Acts of Vengeance because there's a banner with the Acts of Vengeance over the top of it. So we see that this is part of, you know, it's it's a part of it, but it's a comical part of Acts of Vengeance. Well, I think, I think it's cool that they, you know, it's like that, that gave them plenty of... Um fodder you know it gave them a bunch of you know destroyed uh you know monuments and landmarks whether they're you know fictional things like avengers mansion or it's like the real thing like the george washington bridge or the daily bugle or whatever you know it's like oh well here's something damage control conceivably would would be hired to fix you know like once once all that crap went down you know once gravitron pulled up the daily building from from out of the pavement, it's like, oh, of course, damage control. They would call them to, to try and repair that, that. You know, that's what I forgot to mention from the last issue, and that you see through all these issues. Okay, you mentioned Marvel Spotlight is where uh, the the supervillains broke out of the vault. Well, they they have a little editor's notes there, and I like that. I like how they for each of the damages in here for each of the things that happened. They either didn't make it up for this comic. They got it from another comic book and Marvel continuity they keep mentioning like okay the Marvel spotlight 
the, the guys broke out. You you could see that story in Marvel Spotlight, but you see the aftermath of it here in Damage Control. I like that. And this is back in the days in the 80s and 70s when they used to do that and say, oh, for further information or further stories that disconnected with this story, go check out this comic book. Yeah, you had your you had your little footnotes and, and reference stuff. Yeah, I yeah, I always loved that. Yeah, but they don't do that any. I mean, they could they could benefit from doing that now. The, the last just... the last time I remember something like that happening because they made a big deal about it was in uh, the the reboot Superman title saying like for for whatever this gobbledygook is, read Stormwatch number one or whatever. You know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, I remember that one yeah. when I but, uh, I was reading those actions and stuff. Yeah, but yeah, and they and they should continue to do it because it, I mean they're just like with the thought, thought bubbles ain't cool now is seen as dated. I guess those uh, editors' notes are also seen as dated, but I don't. Hmm. I like it. Maybe I'm yeah. just old. I'm. I guess yeah. Me too. Because I I I love I, I I appreciate these comics from that that time period. I mean I I you know when when I listen to to some of the criticism you have on the show about things like I I kind of you know when you when you say the stuff about you know you like reading done in one stories and you like uh, you know uh, you know you know sometimes you 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 have to sort of acclimate yourself to the decompressed style of storytelling where they sort right. of write for the trade and stuff like that. It's like you know, Obviously, these aren't all "quote unquote" done in one. I mean, it's part of a four-issue miniseries, but like certain things happen and finish, and there's also you know B and C plots that continue you know through to the next issue. But even that, in some ways, you know, when you do a decompressed story, you lose that. Like I kind of miss, you know, like you're talking about you know referencing you know issues, which to me is like free advertisement and is kind of like a no-brainer. Like why wouldn't exactly. you want to? you know, advertise, oh, go buy this too, like, by the way, or whatever. Like, I don't know why you wouldn't want to do that. Um, not not for something as stupid as it's dated, but, um, you know, the, uh, the also, like, just having, like, a B and C and even Z, you know, storyline or whatever, you know, I kind of miss the fact that, you know, these days, if you, if you did, like, say, the Hobgoblin, you know, in a comic mm-hmm. book, it'd be, like, six issues, and it'd be all, you know, decompressed yeah. and panned out, and it'd be, like, how the Hobgoblin was smacked as a child for, like, one issue, <laughs> and then you get into how Hobgoblin, like, spray-painted his costume orange in the second mm-hmm. issue, and then maybe by the third or fourth issue, you'd be lucky enough, and he'd actually, like, be the fucking Hobgoblin, <laughs> and then by, like, the sixth issue, they get into a fight, and it ends too quick for you, you know? But, like, you know, back in the day, it was kind of, like, there could be a mystery and Spider-Man could fight the Hobgoblin and then he wouldn't fight the Hobgoblin for a couple issues. Exactly. And then they could pick it up later for a couple issues and be like, oh, hey, remember when he, you know, dumped Lefty Donovan in the ocean? Well, sh- now I've got to, you know, put a spider tracer on the, you know, Hobgoblin fan exactly. and go chase him. And, you know, just, you know, running threads. I mean, sometimes the, you know, the, the, the peril of that is sometimes creative teams change and they make shit up and you know that's why i guess the way the hobgoblin ended the way it did but i i kind of miss that kind of stuff where you could have a, a long running storyline like you know even if it's something goofy like you know who's the ex trader or you know whatever whatever kind of long running you know storylines they had like i kind of miss that about yeah. you know like i guess old school comics or whatever the, the writer's ego is probably bigger today, and they can that they want their own little storyline. But this that's at the cost of the comic book company because if they start a six issue decompressed storyline now, if the readers don't like the first couple issues, then a bunch of readers will drop off, and you don't have anybody for the thanks for a month buying you until that storyline's over. But what you were talking about, even with the Hobgoblin, because I had all those Spider Mans in the eighties when it, you know when the Hobgoblin storyline was just going across years, like it seemed like years, but it, but you had the stories there and then he was the C storyline or the, or the D storyline. And then he, for a couple of issues later, he'd be come to the forefront, the A storyline. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you could jump in at any point and start reading those, you know, but you can't do that nowadays. But back to this issue, we got, we got Punisher who, uh, <laughs> Who you know what you know what's funny about that? When I was younger, like around this era, like during you know nineteen eighty nine, nineteen ninety, uh, it's funny. Like my tastes have changed, and I, I've come to appreciate Punisher and certain Punisher comics and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. I think when I was that age, like I didn't get the Punisher. 
Like, I was like, dude, he's wearing a bunch of white. Like, somebody could shoot him, and, like, what, he's just a dude <laughs> with some guns? Like, why why does he give Spider-Man such a hard time? Like, should Spider-Man just, <laughs> like, flick his wrist, and that's that's the end of it? You know, like, I, I didn't understand a lot of it, and he was, he was, like, one of a couple characters where I just didn't get them. You know, like, I, I think when I was younger, I'd never gotten Namor, you know, because I was like, dude, he's naked, and he's got little wings on his feet, and he's got a Speedo, <laughs> you know, like, what? Like, you know, like, I just, you know, n- and nowadays, it's like, I, I, I appreciate certain stuff, like Bill Everett, and, you know, uh, you know, I, I liked reading the, the John Byrne Namor series, and stuff like that, and, you know, so it's like, uh, you know, your tastes change, you know, as you get older, or you try different stuff, but, you know, at the time, I remember not really digging Punisher. So, like, one of my favorite lines in this is, like, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but it's just funny because they they go through his origin, but, like, there's this really funny-ass line where it's just, like, he's going through his origin story and it's, like, Mafia hitmen shot my family. I didn't do anything about it. You know, and that's like, that's basically his origin. It's like, like, my family got shot and I didn't do shit, you know? And I thought it was kind of funny because, like, I mean, you know, yeah, I could see like a Punisher fan going, well, dude, he got shot too and he was flying the kite and this and that and the other exactly. thing, you know, and, and making all kinds of rationalizations. But I think it's funny, it gets like straight to the core of the matter to people who, you know, kind of don't get it and, and aren't into it. It's just like, I was there, there was a picnic, my family got shot, I didn't do shit. Now I'm mad, and I'm gonna do something about it, you know. So I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, I was thinking that stood out to me too because like any other story, uh, time they recap his origin, it's just like his family got shot, and it's like, well, where was he? And obviously, he probably didn't have any guns. I don't blame him. He didn't have any gun on him. He was with his family. He wasn't in a soldier state of mind. He thought he was back to civilization that's how i always saw it well like i always he, i always took it as like i mean i know there's different versions of the origin story but I, i've read enough of them now where you know i'm like i i could tell you the technical details is probably he got shot up as much as the rest of them did but he actually you know lived through it you know like that's kind of how okay. i always took it but like here it's kind of like this funny thing of like you know more of a you know, because it's borderline parody. He doesn't get shot up, and he does that almost like, you know, I'd say like a DC thing where he's sitting there, you know, raising his, his fist to the sky and the silhouette, <laughs> like, you know, damn you for ruining my kite picnic, you know, like, I will have vengeance, <laughs> you know, like, you know, basically. And they they treat him like that, dude. Or I'm trying to think of what any kind of parody of superheroes, and in this kind where he's not a superhero, he's a nutball, and this makes him into a parody of that nutball. Like, he walks into the office with his guns blazing because he knows that Kingpin was involved with uh, damage control at some point, and he stink- thinks they still are. So he just goes up in there to shoot the place up, but he sees, instead he sees the office is crowded, busy. There's a bunch of people in there wanting the services. They're, they're in the waiting room waiting to talk to somebody. It's like tons of people, and it, nobody's paying attention to him. And he's and he's he's like, yo, I'm the Punisher. You know, he's got his gun. Nobody, that's you know, that's a little bit crazy. But he still, I was like, okay, the Punisher. You know, he's not gonna sit there and let people ignore him. So he shoots up the up the place, starts shooting up the, I'm um, not the people, but the ceiling above him. And it's and Robin Chapel comes in and confronts him, and he put he holds her as hostage. That's what <laughs> he they make him the bag. Well, because Punisher is crazy. And he often looks like a crazy bad man when he confronts the other superheroes. But in his own comic, he seems like a hero. You know, when when his own, you know, the, the, his own universe stories, like the Garth Ennis stories, he's the hero. Well, Garth Ennis makes him a little bit crazy. But when he's anytime he has any other heroes facing him, he looks crazy. And in this case, they use Doctor Doom, and it's a, actually a Doom bot, and the Doom bot that Gene puts together stops uh actually scares punisher off a little bit and he and he saves robin chapel with this doom bot and i think it's funny the the thing where dr doom's the hero in this situation and, and punisher is running away yeah that's that's why i think it's like kind of like borderline parody especially of like in this case with like the punisher it's kind of like taking you know their pot shots at like the grim and gritty type stuff that I mean because if you think about it what it's like Dark Knight Returns was what like 1984 or something so it's only like been you know five or six years it's not like it's 
you know, status quo yet or anything, but there, I'm sure there were plenty of comics. You know, by this point, you probably had like two or three Punisher titles, and, and already, you know, it, it kind of reminds you of stuff where they go through his war journal at the beginning of this, and it kind of reminds me more of, say, like, what the you know, than, yeah, yeah, than, than yeah. the real Punisher yeah. type stuff where, you know, it's like in a, in a you know, like you said, if, if, if Mike Barron wrote a Punisher story or, you know, wh- whoever you're talking about, like Garth Ennis or Chuck That's Dixon exactly what I was talking about. That's you know, what I meant. Yeah, it's like, it's like, it's like there, it's, it, you know, it's kind of <laughs> taken seriously and you kind of go through it. But, you know, a lot of people can kind of, you know, see the holes in the cheese and kind of just kind of be like, oh, this is kind of funny and stuff like that and whatever. I mean, you know, it's interesting though because because it, it does it does kind of walk that tightrope borderline because there's some stuff that's really silly with the Punisher, but then he does have some moments of kind of clarity, especially with um, what, Robin, what's your name, Robin? Robin yeah, Chapman. you know, yeah. So it's like there's there's some moments where he he shares those with her, and you're kind of like, oh, you know what? He's, you know, yeah, you think he's kind of a nut job, but she can kind of see you know, the person that used to be there or whatever, and, and, and they kind of have some sort of, you know, you, you're almost kind of wondering, like, dude, Punisher, you should just bang Robin, man. She's like, she's right there. <laughs> like, it'll be cool. You can forget about the war and maybe be happy or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, obviously that's not going to happen. But, you know, like... You well, he see, put like, he put a gun to her head earlier in the issue. <laughs> so, he, so I don't think she'll yeah, date yeah. him. <laughs> but there's a funny scene where, okay, when Punisher went into the building, he knocked the shit out of one of the security guards. And later on in the episode... Or the issue, I mean, the guy is sitting there with, uh, uh, I forgot what you call it, but like a makeshift kind of. Um, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got like the. Uh, he's, he's got an artillery gun, yeah, like a Gatling gun, and he's behind behind this barricade that he's made. And, and he's got a. Yeah, he's, got, he's got like all the sandbags built up. Yeah, stuff. sandbags. That's what it is. And, and as Robin and John coming through the building for another work day, he's got the Gatling gun points at him. He's like, Hawk, who goes there? And he says, I'm quitting this job, Robin. I can't take it no more. And, and, and she says to to John in the elevator, or the Punisher was here last night. He knocked knocked Jay out. And he says, John said, oh, he's lucky he didn't get shot. And But I'm like, they're making fun of, <laughs> of, you know, this guy was victimized by the Punisher. And then it's kind of a dark comedy to me, maybe even unintentionally so, but I – I just think that's funny. That is well. I think I think kind of like what we talked about with like the last mini series. It's like it's like there's some. I mean, if you honestly thought about it, and it wasn't like one of these cases where you know, oh, it's Sunday afternoon and all the buildings were empty when the big robot smashed into it or whatever. You know, like like if you kind of you know put that aside, then you're kind of like, oh yeah, okay, this is for humor and for funny stuff. You know, and it's kind of the same thing with the Punisher. It's like if a real person came into your place of business with like an Uzi and put it to someone's head and shot up the wall and, you know, it was like, uh, I don't want to wait in line and take a number, you know, you'd probably be pretty upset and traumatized and everything. But in this case... They're they're trying to play that for laughs, and you know you either sort of go along, you know, for the ride with it, you know, or you sort of you know kind of like what they say about the George Washington Bridge. It's like either you buy that Thor can hold this fucking thing up, or you you, you know you pick it apart like it's uh, you know I don't know a blueberry muffin or whatever. I don't know you know like so. There's some other highlights in this issue because there's a lot of stuff that goes on in in each of these issues, but uh. The, well, there's an ongoing story we we'll talk about later with Captain America and uh, well, actually the um, the Avengers Mansion and the Axe Avengers Avengers Mansion. Somehow it got dumped into the the river or the lake. The ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. I think it, I'm trying to remember it was on who, the island. who the robots were. It was like because it was like they, they. I forget whose robots they were because they were like switching everybody's bad guys around. But I think maybe it was like the Mad Thinker or somebody. I just remember a shitload of robots came. And like we're you know carting off the uh, the mansion, and it ended up sinking into the the ocean or whatever. So and then this is trying to pick up on the pieces of that, I guess, and have and them the, have I, them salvage it like it's the Titanic or something. And, and uh, in here, uh, Jarvis the Butler is hiring uh, damage control, but <laughs> but for some reason he's got a, a patch on his eye. Is this after he got beat beat up by the? Um... Masters of Evil, or is that a real? That, I wonder that's, if that's, a that's that's yeah, that's a real eye patch. I think 
I'm trying to I'm remember just, if I was. I'm thinking if it's from the injury from a couple of years before this. I'm, not, I'm trying the, to remember if it's not a fake eye patch or not. You know, I don't remember. Like that's something. Like if I if I did something, I'd like have to research it because I don't even remember. But I, I'm trying to remember if it's like one of those stupid things where he like pulls up his eye and is like, "Oh, sirs, I don't <laughs> really have a eye. It's just to look cool." You know, or okay. whatever. But like, I'm trying to remember if that's what what the deal is or not, but I don't, I don't recall. I, I do recall I patched Jarvis from that, that era, but I don't remember okay. why or how. Okay. Other, uh, little points in here. I'll just go across real quick. Uh, Robbie Baldwin, AKA Speedball, but he's hired as Robbery Baldwin, t- regular teenager. Uh, Bart, who is an intern at damage control gets Robbie, who is his friend. He gets him in as an in- intern. So that's, Something that happens, uh, yeah. Because I guess I guess once uh, once Robin gets promoted, she asks him Bart to be her full time assistant. So he's he's promoted from intern status to like a full, you know full time employee. So so, so that, he, that he has to get a he, his first job is to run out and get an intern. So he hires Robbie. So that's that's a pretty cool way to to sneak you know sneak a superhero in there under the radar. And. Uh, also, Gene Strausser, the you know the genius who works in the basement with the robots and shit, he gets fired, and automatically goes crazy and says, "I swear, damage control will feel my wrath." <laughs> now he's fired because Carlton Company took so took over, and they built a giant building around the flat iron building <laughs> that uh, damage control used to be in, uh, because Elbert doesn't want them to take tear that building down as a landmark, and and they are real cheap. They and you will see that we see the effects of their cheapness, and, and they're just cutting um, costs all across the company, including Gene. They fire Gene. And two other points I wanted to point out here uh, was one scene that flowed for me is when this little he's kind of a slimy little guy who works for Carlton. He's a little toy. You know what? You know what I kept thinking, and this is this is Zippert. It, it, it was funny. I kept thinking, like, look, it's Dwayne McDuffie and Bruce Tim. Like, you know. <laughs> <But, yeah. laughs> did, oh, did they have that kind of uh, relationship? No, I, I don't know uh, if they did or didn't. But like, I just, you know how, like, because the last time we talked about it, I kind of said like how Albert kind of reminds me. I'm like, uh, yeah, it's kind of the same too. way. Like, like if you're reading Invisibles, you're like, oh yeah, King Mob is totally Grant Morrison. You know, so like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, dude, like Albert is kind of. You know, to be, I'm like, Albert, Albert's kind of Dwayne McDuffie, you know? So when I saw the guy, uh, Liebert, that you said comes in from the, the what is it, the, the Charlton, Charlton Co. Co. Yeah. Company or whatever, yeah. Yeah. like, yeah. like I was kind of like, oh, dude, he's a blonde guy, and he's got, he's got big, big, uh, you know, Coke bottle glasses. I'm like, dude, it's Bruce Tim. Like, you know, I just... Okay, oh, that's Mr. Atkinson, that's Mr. Oh, the blonde okay. guy. With okay. the, but but Lippert is his little toady oh, guy. Oh, he's his, like, right-hand dude or whatever. Yeah, and he hits on Robin, but the scene that flows for me is when he he has to go work with John. He, t- he tells Lippert to go um, follow John around, um, you know, at the different construction sites. And he says, hey, <laughs> good to be working with you, Jim. And John says, John, right, can you tell me about Robin over there? Uh, what do you what do you want to know about her? I don't know, Jake. The usual is how old is she? Is she married? What does she look like naked? And then John puts his arms around <laughs> Lippert and says she's thirty four, she's single, and as to the last, a gentleman never discusses such matters. And just to see that scene, because usually the the dialogue here is choppy. He to me he just it's utilitarian most of the time, but here this flows. There's a real. You can see he's kind of concerned for Robin. And he doesn't like this little slimy guy, Lip- Lippard. And uh, I don't know if you have any comments on that. I uh, thought I thought it was a weird image, like because because it, it kind of like to me like it was one of those things where it, it, you definitely take pause when you see that one panel where he finally when he finally says you know like and a gentleman never you know discusses such things you know because you could kind of i guess what you're saying is he's sort of being protective of robin so it's like it's like it's kind of uh, such a um it's kind of a uh the penultimate 
I don't know, character act that, that he, or arc <laughs> that he goes through. You know, it's like yeah. he kind of tries to play like he's cool, aloof, like, oh, yeah, I'm cool, I don't really care, and I'm not, you know, like, like I guess, uh, not to spoil, like, some of the ending, but, like, he, you know, he ends up saving that little girl or whatever, you know, from the, the, the yeah. you know, building or whatever yeah, he's, and it's yeah, kind of it's kind of the same thing it's like yeah he's a good guy but he doesn't want anybody to know he's a good guy so he like he hands the girl to captain america and it's like look it's mm-hmm. gonna be bad for my my quote-unquote image you know my image is like a you know a mean you know corporate tough guy whatever it is and so like there it's like he's kind of being the mean corporate tough guy but to to sort of you know protect you know, uh, someone who I guess is his friend and colleague, right? Because he's kind of basically laying the smack down on this other guy, just kind of going, look, you know, like, stay stay away from her. It, sort of in his own, like, you know, sort of... His, yeah, his way of doing it, because he said, guy never scuts such matters as if maybe he did something with her. But but he, you know, he's... And later on, well, I don't, I don't know about the, the, the next volume but we'll see because i haven't read volume three and i'm I'm looking forward to see if they got together in that one because they definitely get together in volume four but but, uh we'll get to that later the last thing i want to mention about this point about this issue is the way when duffy put in a bunch of little rate things on race between (laughs) black people and white america i saw he snuck that in to me some may have been a little heavy-handed like uh at the beginning, Mayor Koch is bugging Robin to help him to fix up the city, <laughs> and she kind of disrespects Mayor Koch. But Mayor Koch has a bunch of you know Secret Service type men around him, and uh, body you know city bodyguards. But one of the guys in suits is a black guy, <laughs> and he has a a pin of election pin with Koch's name on it, crossed out, and the words Dinkins over it, which is a black mayor, <laughs> Mayor Dinkins, uh, who replaced who was you know who replaced uh mayor Koch after his terms in office yeah this was the i think this was the last year he was he was in office or whatever but he he was he was mayor of new york for a long time yeah and, he, and people liked him and stuff and, and dinkins didn't do that good of a job from what i heard he wasn't like yeah, he wasn't I, I, I think i don't know like I, I i was too young to know too much about it you know at the time but i i think there's there's uh plenty of it seems like there's like a lot of history like with people that you know they 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 had you know a lot of good things that he did in his career and then there was a lot of you know things that people took issue with so i mean i guess that's going to be true of anybody you know so yeah that's true and then the last racial thing in this, in this comic is when uh elbert confronts mr atkinson the guy from the, the carlton company and and he was saying and he's trying to tell, you know, he's trying to tell this guy important things about the company that they they need the money, they can't be cutting cutting costs. And Ackerson says to Albert, you know, who is the stand-in for Dwayne McDuffin, he says, "Mr. Cleary, I make the executive decisions here now, not you. Carlton Company, Carlton Co. policy is to save its tokens for the front office and the subways." And then there's a silent panel where. Albert is looking kind of pissed off in the distance. And for some reason, there's a television behind Ackerson. I don't know why. It has a black, like a black, it looks, I guess he's a, um, a fireman rescuing a woman, a white woman from a fire. I don't know what that's about. That's heavy-handed as a motherfucker. But, but we get the point <laughs> that Ackerson is an asshole and a racist to boot or, or, you know, has bigotry tendencies. And he just walks out and he's, has a parting parting shot for Elbert. He says, uh, "I find affirmative action to be so tedious, don't you?" And that's when they cut to the next scene, and Gene is fired, and Gene swears revenge. And basically, that, those are the points uh, in this issue. But oh, it, Punisher comes back to the office to confront them again. But Robin stands up to him, and he kind of likes her. He he kind of gets her, and he. Basically, he leaves. He wants to kill. He yeah. wants to kill Lippert. I like. But. I like. It. It's like you. You want to <laughs> shoot him, or you want me to shoot him? And uh, and the last final final shot of this thing is when um, Carlton Company c- cuts everybody's checks, or or they give them low paychecks, or they don't pay them at all. Whatever the the workers, the construction workers for damage, uh, damage control, 
and, and he's like smiling. He's like, what he says there? He says, uh, then he has a decision to make. Either he's a poorly paid blue collar grub or he's a newly, newly promoted exec with a new big office. Basically, he's trying to get Lenny to sell out, make these people work for him for nothing. And he knows Lenny has this way, but Lenny does not sell out. He picks up a picket sign and all the guys, they, it's a strike. You know, all the people who work, the workers, the real important hands of uh, damage control, the construction workers, they all go on strike. Yeah, he's like, he's like, I guess I'm a grub then, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, yeah, then he's no sellout. And then, but of course, you know, John, Robin and the rest of them, they got to stay on. Uh, they don't, they don't go for the strike. That's the last image in that issue. The next issue was, oh, was basically, see, all of them had a theme, but this doesn't really have a theme. I don't, I don't, just basically the company is crumbling. Everybody's on strike. And uh, that's the old Rob. I mean, uh, Bart has a little crush on the new secretary. On, or not, not the new secretary, but the old secretary. The black guy who was fired <laughs> because because of the guy who used to work for the MTA and the and the World Trade Center who got fired through no fault of his own. He he is recruited by Gene to get revenge on damage control and they got two new robot suits or exo suits that look ridiculous <laughs> and uh basically that and then there's some more stuff for captain america and the um and the the avengers but there's a thing in here where the workers you know they don't have anybody to do the construction since everybody's on strike but she they recruit she hawk and since they can get superheroes sometimes to help them do their job because it basically you're saving the city. The city is on fire. You see television screens all over the place <laughs> in all these issues that have just images of the city on fire, buildings crumbling, explosions, and there's nobody there to fix fix everything. Yeah, that's because that's because acts of vengeance, man. Full swing. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. I, 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 I love that crossover. Right? I think I think that was like one of my favorite. Uh favorite things ever and then i i always kind of thought like the dc version of that was uh was underworld unleashed but i i kind of like both of those but um uh did they switch in underworld Unleashed? did they switch up villains not really in underworld unleashed it's more like you know you know how they kind of have the cadre that's that's led by loki and acts of vengeance with like the five dudes so it's like yeah. you know mandarin and red skull and dr doom and uh who else is it? Magneto and uh, there was one other dude. I can't remember who it was. Oh, it's, like, um, it's like the same five in Dark Rain, huh? <laughs> so, so they and the Kingpin. Yeah, that was the fifth. And then, um, but like in uh, in Underworld Unleashed, it's like Neuron kind of plays the the Loki role and gathers everybody up. But their their head cadre was like Luther, the Joker, Cersei, Doctor Polaris. And I think there was like one other dude that I can't think of off the top of my head. But like, you know, that that was more about, you know, I guess power upgrades and, and, and villains going from, quote unquote, you know, Morty Silver Age looks like Killer Moth being like a useless nobody to making like, you know, basically, you know, Killer Moth like sells his soul to Neuron and then he gets a big power upgrade, which is basically he kind of looks like, I don't know if you've ever seen like, like, uh, killer moth in the batman cartoon or whatever but it's like he starts out like a goober and then he becomes this big monster but that basically happens in the comics because neuron you know it's like i think at the time like luther was like a wafy little you know uh you know <laughs> like luther, <a> wafy. patient <laughs> yeah yeah well because it's like he was like dying or whatever oh and or so, the cancer. yeah, yeah the cancer. and so the, so the so basically like he he um you know basically he he, he sold his soul for you know, renewed youth and by it basically like it, it's like he, he oh, basically you know turned back into the physique and build of like Silver Age Luthor for the most part. You know, and it's like you know, um, but like th those were, were cool crossovers. And then like I think this number three issue of Damage Control, the second volume, like that was something I remember actually buying. You know, like I was like I remember being a kid and buying that in the store and seeing the little. You know, like what you were talking about before, the little banner and everything, where you're like, oh, I got to get all of these. Like, this is awesome, you know, or whatever. And uh, 
I think I think in that what's funny is they have all this stuff like I, I don't know if, if you play video games at all, but there's like a, a funny mm-hmm. nod to uh, She Hulk, like because back in the day, like this, she always used to break the fourth wall because that's what John Byrne yeah. had her do in that that second yeah. volume. So there's funny ass lines in this were like you know that you like you're talking about the two assholes with like the Morty you know mech armor or whatever it is that's like orange and blue. It's like she's, she's like she's like she turns to the panel. She's like the Falco. You know, like she's all pissed off at the editor and stuff. And they actually reference, um, they kind of make a slam, I guess, about the whole fiasco that happened with the ceremony miniseries. Because I guess, you know, like John Byrne was pissed off because I guess in that miniseries they kept writing her as, you know, she she was shaving or something and the, really? the razor... The razor keeps breaking on her mm-hmm. legs because she's She-Hulk, you know, because she's invulnerable. But, like, I guess John Byrne was like, why is she that stupid? Like, either she knows she's invulnerable. No, I, no, I don't know. You know, I guess his point was like. It, she wouldn't it, be it, wasting her time with that. Yeah, it, she's like, it could happen maybe once, you know. But mm-hmm. it's like, it was, it was not like she's going to try it like 15 times for your, your <laughs> joke or whatever. And he got all grumpy about it. And I guess over that, he actually, you know, left the book. You know, so so like I guess that was like a slam on that because like there's like this thing where, you know, she basically is like, well, you know, it could be worse. Like I, she or she says something like, I, I promise, I promise to never yeah, I won't, I won't, you know, I won't shave my legs anymore if you just give me like some good villains to fight or whatever. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I, yeah. And I didn't get that reference. Now I understand where that's coming from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what that was about. But like that, you know, that stuff I always thought was funny, but. I guess I brought up the video game. Like, if you if you win with She-Hulk in, um, in Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, because I guess what happens is Deadpool's, like, the primary, you know, break-the-fourth-wall character in that video game. So he does all kinds of crazy shit where he'll, like, beat you to death with his life meter and, like, you know, basically sort of break the fourth wall in the video game and stuff like that when he wins and stuff. But uh, She-Hulk, I guess, has this, like, you know, win quote where she's like, you know, hey, if this was, like, you know, 20 years ago, I'd be the one beating you with a life bar, you know? <laughs> and, like, so it's kind of like a nod to the the good old uh, days of She-Hulk, you know? So. John Byrne, the, the second run, anyway. And, yeah, the other highlights of the issue is uh, they got a <laughs> – they do a quick little origin recap of Speedball. Oh, because Speedball has to help She-Hulk fight these two – assholes in, in the mecha suits uh because yeah while she's trying to fix this building she's trying to put the deli bugle back right again because it's damaged due to acts of vengeance so she's fighting these two mecha guys even though she should be able to handle them with no problem by herself but no she's having trouble fighting them while, and fixing this building at the same time and lenny's up there laughing at her because <laughs> because you know she broke the what you call she walked past the the union past the strike yeah, you know, she broke the union line, and uh, Robbie. Uh, now, this is what I think is interesting. You know how Speedball's power works. He has to bounce against something really hard to activate his power, but he decides to jump off a building because the harder he hits something, um, the harder the en- energy when he hits, the more powerful he is from the impact. But th- <laughs> for the first time, he tra- decides to jump off a tall building <laughs> to activate his power. But he doesn't know if it's going to work, but he has to help She-Hulk. So he, he jumps off the tall building, and he'll be powerful enough to defeat help her defeat these guys. thought that was cute. And, they, of course, they defeat the guys. They find out it's Gene. And uh, I like that character, but they want to, now he has to go to jail because he, he, you know, he tried to, he committed an act of terrorism, you know. And, uh, and that's his little act of vengeance. Get it? That's, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the tie-in. <laughs> Yeah. That's that's what that's why the the banner. Well, it's cool. They had a lot of cool like double entendre in this. Where like after after they go through the whole thing, you know, they they collapse the one uh, building, and then Lenny's got that funny line where he's like he's like, if you break the fourth wall, the whole structure falls <laughs> on you. Yeah. You know, and it's like it's it's basically you know tongue in cheek at like She Hulk breaking the fourth wall and stuff like that. And then there's like that funny line where like you know Speedball comes to like help up She Hulk, and she's like he's like, hey, you know, I'm I'm Speedball, and she's like, drugs aren't the answer, kid. Just say no. <laughs> you know, so it's like it's basically like wink, like we know fucking you know a Speedball is is uh you know not just a superhero. Wink, wink. You know. And um, there's another line here. I I can't 
felt to mention this before we move on, if I could find it. When she when she yells the photo at, at when she breaks the football like it in the Burn, John Byrne comics, and she yells Defalco. Uh, <laughs> she, they don't know what she's referring to. Well, oh, they have that line where he's like, he's like, why does she keep talking about the the cigars? Like it's like Defalco cigars. I don't know. Like they're they're cheap. Yeah. Like. You know, so that, right. Yeah, that's a little jab at Tom DeFalco from uh, McDuffie there. Yeah. And at the end of the issue, we see Robin is, you know, she's admitting to herself that she's in over her head, and she calls Mrs. Hogue, and Mrs. Hogue blows her off, like, I got some important shit to do. <laughs> and we see that tonight. I like this little panel of Robin by herself, you know, in the office alone, putting the phone down. She has no one to turn to, and she's kind of, her face is in the shadows. And I thought that was good, well done. And we see Mrs. Hogue and Elbert are together, and they're formulating a plan with none other than Nick Fury, the real Nick Fury, the Caucasian Nick Fury, <laughs> not uh, Samuel Jackson. So, but uh, that's issue who, three. Who, who does have an eye patch, just like Jarvis. Yes, yes. But we he's established for having that for years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But Jarvis, I don't know what's going on Jarvis. And there's more. Oh. I, I should look that up now. I forget why, but but I was we, I was thinking should... he was steered from because it had only been a... oh from from when the what Master, the, uh, Masters of Evil. Masters of Evil kicked his yeah. ass. No, that was I, that. Well, think that's Masters of Evil was like was like was like two hundred seventy something. I think two seventy seven or something. And this is like around Avengers three hundred eleven. So yeah. I don't I don't it think is that's for, it is like I three think... years later. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I'm right, but I think it's one of those things where he's like, "Oh, this is just for show, chaps." Like, I don't, I don't think it's real, okay. but I could. In be that wrong. case, Jarvis, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to say, to you, Jarvis. And they got a little recap again. In each issue, they have a recap. They have a recap that the heroes are busy across the city. The city is being destroyed by oh the people, the acts of vengeance, and they showing the deadly pact among the world's most evil men. And okay, you have it here. Magneto, like you said, Red Skull, Mandarin, I guess that is in the back. No. Yeah, that's Mandarin. <laughs> it's like shit. Uh, Doctor Doom, Kingpin, and is that the, the wizard from the Master of Evil? That's what it looks like. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's he, the wizard. Yeah. He's not in the league of those other five. Yeah, yeah. He they they put him there. I think I think because he's supposed to be like the. I mean, I don't know. He's supposed to. Be, you know, he led the frightful four. So I think they're trying to. You know, he's supposed to be like one of the Reed Richards types of the group. You know, another. I mean, I know you got Doctor Doom. So what do you need with the wizard? But yeah. you know, I I don't know. It's like he 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 was he was there. He had a big head. He was doing some stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. okay, and then basically the upshot of this issue is uh, Albert and Mrs. Hogue. They're gonna try to take control i guess i don't know i guess maybe you're right i mean i don't know how much i trust wikipedia but it it, it, i just looked at it real quick for like eye patch so it kind of talks about what we were talking about the masters of evil attacking the mansion and then after that it just says it took some time for jarvis to recover he even wore an eye patch so maybe 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 that's why because it wouldn't take he's a he's like an older gentleman he's not a superhero so it takes him time yeah they 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 took his wallet. Like they, they beat the crap out of Jarvis. Yeah, and that. I mean, he was in the hospital for a long time after that. And even though this is four years, three or three, I think these three years later, I could see in comic book time. Yeah, yeah, it's Marvel time. It's like it's been like three weeks. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's it's been, still it's been seventy-two hours since since the Masters of Evil screwed up the mansion. For the lucky, he could walk. <laughs> he got punched full on by the Doctor Mister Hyde. But yeah. uh, so um, Lippard overhears that uh, Ackerson is in trouble and that they're probably going to get out the company and he'll be out of a job. And, and but we see across town, Elbert and uh, Hogue is dealing with Shield, uh, Nick Fury. They're gonna they're gonna buy out. They're gonna do the hostile takeover of uh, of damage control so they can get back control of the company and fix the city. And there's a cool little guy. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Agents. I forgot his name. I, I look. There's a oh the the tech guy. Oh, 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 he's a tech guy. Yeah, he's also he's just a badass shield agent, and he said his name a thousand times. I don't know why. Oh, Pierce, Agent Pierce. Pierce. Yeah. So he's like a cool. So he's, he's and then Guy Rick makes a appearance. He's here. like he's he's making uh he's making like Microsoft Office right there before uh before Microsoft <laughs> Office was invented. He's like, dude, Wait. just put it all in a spreadsheet. <laughs> what year is Microsoft Office? I mean, we're not I Office, but, but they had. The, well, yeah, you know what, they, they, probably, they probably 
they probably had something like that. Well, Megatons then, probably had probably, but it was probably really limited. It, it's not like. It's, uh, but sure Mac wasn't was... limited. This probably is a Mac. <laughs> That's probably what it is. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, what? Oh, and then there's Henry Guyrick, the asshole, who's always giving the Avengers problems. He makes a little appearance, and there's a there's a female here who's a shapeshifter, and she takes his shape of his body, and she incapacitates him. And uh, when Mrs. Hogue. Oh, and I like this too. Uh, he's he's been you know for a long time, even in the eighties. Guyrick was trying to pass the Superhero Registration Act before Civil War. Uh, yeah, he was he was the he was one of the guys along with Val Cooper who was on that original Captain America Council too. So like I, I remember he was like in the Avengers. He was doing the Captain America thing, and then they kind of I think the X Men kind of appropriated him, you know, and they said, oh, let's just have him be a you know, one of our bad guys or whatever, you know. And then the woman who shapeshifts to become Guy Rick, she tries to put a stop to Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Hogue. She's, Mrs. Hogue has a report on why Superhero Registration Act won't work, but this this woman is trying to, or this Guy Rick imposter is trying to put a stop to it. Of course, it's foiled by S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, and he gives a little, of course, well, Nick Fury has to give a little shot at, uh, what's his face, uh, Guyrick before they leave. Guyrick's in his underwear, and he says, uh, don't you have your underwear on backwards, dude? <laughs> and basically, this, this is, this is kind of an un, un, uneventful uh, issue. Well, it's, it's the last issue of the, of this miniseries. But she, Robin, is trying to get the, now I don't understand how she did this. She got, oh, uh, I keep on forgetting these people's names. My, uh, what's the guy? The guy with the cigar. I keep forgetting. Oh, uh, Lenny. Lenny right? Yeah, Lenny. You forget. She's trying to get him to get the guys across the picket line and work. Well, obviously, they should work because they're trying to save people's lives. They probably would have to work in real life, but here I don't see know how he does it. But he gets them to, to cross the line for no pay, and they save the day. They save the. Uh, the buildings from falling over and people dying and there's the little rescue scene that you pointed out with uh john and captain america and basically the, this thing is about doing a hostile takeover of uh, carlton C- company and they yeah, s- and then uh then uh what's his face Dwayne or, or what's his name his real name the character's name <laughs> albert um, albert albert gets his uh you know, his comeback or his come up and said all the, the snips that the, the Bruce Tim looking guy gave him at the beginning or whatever. Yeah. 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 He says, if you don't want to, he said, um, well, you got to sell, they, they, they're going to sell it for the price that they bought it. And he said, what you talking about? That, that will basically virtually bankrupt me if I buy it, if I'm forced to buy it. And if, and they find out that he's connected to the Kingpin also, that's why the Kingpin sold the company. So he could kind of manipulate it using the Carlton Co., uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, with the Acts of Vengeance. And they find out about this, so they buy it, They force Ackerson to buy the company back. And so now it belongs, once again, it belongs to uh, 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 Mrs. Hogue and the rest of the gang. But this is the little st- part of the story that's kind of interesting, I guess. Robin didn't know that Kingpin once owned <laughs> uh, Damage Control, and she kind of walks out on Hogue. She says... Oh, she. Oh, Hulk says. Oh, wait a minute. I can't. You know, I still can't run the company, Robin. I need you to run it. And she said, Robin says, No, I don't think so. I don't like working for the kingpin. <laughs> and somebody said, Well, you don't work for him anymore. And she says, I will never again. And she goes to kingpin. She's like a dummy. She actually goes up in kingpin's office. I don't know how she gets in there, but she don't. Buster tells him to go fuck off. And she even thinks that she's surprised that he didn't kill her. And as she walks out of the building, <laughs> Punisher was about to kill her. He's like had her in the, his sights, his gun sights, all issue. <laughs> but he, 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 he was gonna he was gonna snipe her yeah. for talking to the kingpin. <laughs> but he but he had a bug on her conveniently, so he overheard the whole conversation. So he knows that she's a good lady. But I'm like, you're gonna waste your time killing a woman who's not here. I mean, they make him look like such a heel in this series, but he is basically the Punisher is a cold blooded murderer. But another favorite But you know what, you know what, uh Tim, I'm okay with that. 
<laughs> that's the Punisher. I know that's that's the Punisher. And what's his face? Uh, oh, this I can't believe. Nick Fury has to give a parting shot to Kingpin when he flies by in his flying convert- convertible, blows a hole in the side of uh, the building in Kingpin's office, and basically says, "We're not the cops. We can get to you." Fisk <laughs> and Fisk is like, oh motherfucker! It's like, wait a minute, you causing more damage <laughs> than than uh, the supervillain fights. I mean, so people could could have died. You you just blew apart this building, but is I think that's kind of is it would have been cool if it wasn't so destructive. But that's Nick Fury, and Nick Fury has on an ascot and <laughs> and like a yeah like a smoking jacket or something. <laughs> I'm like, what the. <laughs> And uh, of course, they put Gene to work, so he helps. Um, he also helps in saving the city, even though he's on parole. So he's in, you know, he has to go back to jail, but they let him out so he can help fix the building, even though I wouldn't trust them. And uh, because they got the control of the company back, they 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 pull up the whole building that the Carlton Company built around the flat iron flat iron building, even though I don't know how they built a giant building like that so fast but <laughs> they say or they say okay what you gonna do with this big building with dc on the top and elbert says i sold it to a comic book company uptown apparently they made a great deal of extra money this summer from a movie and we all know what that movie da, is da, da, da. <laughs> yeah that was that was huge summer that of 89 so batman yeah and, and did i tell you this um well, i mentioned it on my show that I was watching a, a documentary on DC Comics. It was a good documentary, the origin of DC Comics. And I was watching it at a long time. Is, is that the one that Ryan Reynolds narrates? Yeah, yeah. But... Okay, because I still haven't seen that yet. People told me that was good, yeah, but was I haven't good. watched it yet. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Uh, but I saw it at a comic convention at the Long Beach Comic Con, and everybody in the audience, the audience was full up with, you know, like people who had to be probably tw- in their mid-20s or younger, like 20 to the 25 they were hard diehard fans because they were all dressed up as dc heroes but when they got to the part of the 80s okay the late 80s they mentioned batman people we were just you know people for the most part were just watching the movie silently but they mentioned batman they didn't say anything the batman movie 1989 but when they got to they and they went into that a little bit too they didn't even cheer for superman in 1977 <laughs> but when they got to DC in the early 90s, they kind of just skipped past all these things that happened in the early 90s. And one of them was a, like a five-second clip of um, the Batman the animated series. And that's when everybody in the audience cheered and screamed. <laughs> and I was surprised. I'm like, damn, this is a ge- different generation. They didn't grow up with ba- – or they were too young for Batman, um, the movie with Tim Burton. And I didn't like that movie myself. But they loved they loved the Batman the animated series. That's what they grew up with. That was their – eight-year-old experience or whatever age they were at the time. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, a, I can see why that's a big deal of a show. I mean, for the most part, it's, it's a pretty good show, you know? So I, uh, but, but yeah, I guess, I guess, you know, it's like, it's like everything else. I always think now when I watch things, even though people are like, you know, they'll say stuff like, uh, you know, Marvel Superhero Squad is for babies or, you know, whatever the criticism is. But I'm like, you know, that's going to be some kids, you know, for me, it was like Super Friends and, and you know, Spider-Man and his amazing friends and stuff like that. But that that's going to be some kids, you know, just like for these these guys that were all there at that con, like that was probably their Super Friends, you know, or whatever. Like the thing that kind of yeah. got them hooked on yeah. Batman or comics or whatever. And, and, and you know, other shows are going to be, you know, like, you know, newer shows are going to be things that get other kids hooked on comics or, you know, hopefully or, or whatever, at least enjoy you know, maybe the the other media and stuff like superheroes, you know, whatever it is. So Yeah, this generation's uh Batman is, you know, Chris Nolan, which I don't have no problem with. I didn't like Tim Burton's original Batman so much. It was I don't know, it was it was uh I just it just didn't work for me. <laughs> so, I don't think I, I think cause I'm the, glad. The 80, 88 and eighty nine, that was when I just started getting into comic specialty shops so i don't i don't know that i knew enough about it to be 
you know, critical of it one way or the other. I just knew I liked it, and it was one of those things where, you know, it was a huge deal. Like, people went ape shit when the trailer was attached to, like, movies and went and, yeah, I think it was, like, attached to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids or something. And I remember people watching that movie, like, seven or eight times just to see the trailer. You know, it was like, they'd go, they'd watch the trailer with the bat wing, and then they'd fucking leave, you know? Like, they're like, <laughs> I saw the trailer! Woo! Yeah. You know, and, like, that's how... What a big deal it was. People were, you know, plopping down five, seven bucks or whatever a movie ticket was back then, you know, just to watch the trailer and then leave. You know? They were like that. breaking open, like, the signs at bus stop with the Batman logo on it, with the, you know, the Batman posters. They were stealing those. They were, they were, they yeah. were, it's like they damaging this property. You risk getting caught just to have that poster. That's how big, the, and everybody had Batman stitched in the, I mean, uh, cut in the back of their hair. You know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember that that like fade cut with like the bat symbol on the back or whatever. Yeah. That's hilarious. And yeah. that that is um these uh damage control. Uh, what you think of this this series compared to the last one? I don't know. It's weird. It's like I I I enjoyed reading them and stuff. Like I I, I have memories of uh like uh, like I said that first issue I bought when I was a kid. Uh, yeah. From the first miniseries, and then with this miniseries, I know I bought that one that has She-Hulk and uh, Speedball on the cover, the third issue with the Acts of Vengeance and stuff. So that's the one I remember the most, like, uh, you know, any kind of nostalgia or fond memories. You know, as as a whole, I, I guess I kind of agree with what you say. Like, there were lo- lots of uh, cool guest stars and funny beats in the first three issues, and then I think... And it's nothing against, like, Nick Fury or anything like that, but it's just, it seems like they had to, like, wrap everything up, you know, and, and, and the, the last issue was less, less eventful. Not, not that there weren't, it wasn't anything going on, but it just, it didn't have the same, like, I don't know, there were, there were key moments where, you know, you could laugh at, like, She-Hulk, you know, breaking the fourth wall, or Thor, or the Punisher acting like a goober, or whatever, you know, like, stuff like that. But in this, it's kind of like they tied up all the loose threads. It's kind of like the Punisher now was, you know, subplot you know you know c or whatever and we tighten that up and it's like oh back to jack and captain america like well let's wrap that up and you know okay nobody's on strike anymore and you know that kind of thing so it's like they just kind of were you know they were kind of tying everything up and and you know because it's like i did did the 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 next one was that in what 1990 again the third Uh, ball i mean 90 or 91 probably late 90 Uh, early 91 yeah yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, it was fun to read. There's, there's plenty of, uh, you know, characters that you could kind of anchor onto from the Marvel universe and stuff. And like you said, uh, you know, I like the the fact that the most of the, uh, you know, damage was related to, you know, acts of vengeance, sh- the shit that was going on at the time. So. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So yeah, overall, yeah, I, I liked it. I guess I give it three out of five. And uh, I, I, I just like the idea of damage control. I, I you know. I, I like it. <laughs> I guess I want to say it didn't live up to my expectations, but actually it kind of does. You know, you got the superheroes involved. You got comedy. The comedy here was better than the comedy in the last one. And I look forward to reading the third uh, series because I haven't, I haven't read that one. Um, I think I have one of the issues here, which damage control the movie, but the other issues I haven't read yet. So, uh, so hopefully we can do that sometime. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be cool. Keep, keep keep up the keep up the trend. We'll, we'll keep doing the damage control till we run out of them. So that's it for today's episode. Be sure to check out my website zoomcast.blogspot.com and Derek's website. He has a podcast Fan Holes that he's a part of. So if you want to check that out, go to fanholespodcast.blogspot.com. And go to Derek's website, The History of Comics on Film. That's H O C O F dot blogspot dot com. Until next time. Oh, wait a minute. Be sure to sign up for the Doomcast web page. Oh, I keep calling it the web page. The Doomcast Facebook page. Just go to the Doomcast website, and up in the right hand corner, there's a link to uh, the new Doom facebook page so check that out and as i was saying peace